Welcome to the CY Learning Mutual Fund six week complimentary boot camp webinar number three. My name is Jason. I'm your host today. I'm one of the regulatory trainers and study coaches here at CY Learning. We are very excited to have all of you with us here today. So before I begin, I want to take a quick moment and share with all of you a recent conversation that I had. I recently talked with a student last week and they told me that they've been following along with our boot camp, but they were in a different course, the Canadian Securities course, and they wondered if they should keep following along. My response, yes, absolutely yes. Let me explain why. Many of the topics that are covered in the mutual funds course are covered in other courses as well. For example, asset allocation, taxation of investment income, such as uh, dividend income, capital gains and interest, uh, investment suitability, registered plans, etc. These topics are covered in the mutual funds course, but also in the Canadian Securities course, the Wealth Management Essentials course, Financial Planning Level 1, Financial Planning Level 2, and, and other courses as well. But these topics are often covered to a much greater detail than in the mutual funds course. So the key point is this, what you're learning in this boot camp will only serve to help and improve you, even if for some of you, it might sometimes feel like just a bit of a refresher. So by all means, definitely stay tuned in and keep going. Secondly, I just want to point out that we are on a number of social media platforms, including LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and others. And I mentioned this because last week we actually had a 24 hour flash sale where we were giving away free 30 day subscriptions to our financial math videos. And the first 250 people all received free subscriptions. Now, anyone in this industry should definitely know how to use a financial math calculator. So you want to be on our social media because sometimes we push out free content and you want to be in the position of taking advantage of those opportunities. And if not you, then perhaps maybe one of your friends. You know what? Let's do that again right now. I'm going to bring it up on the screen. There it is. Let me bring up my laser tool. There's a special coupon code right now for all of you. Bootcamp hyphen FM. It's for you to use at the time of order and it's going to give you our financial math videos for free for 30 days. Again, there's the coupon code bootcamp hyphen FM. FM, of course, short for financial math. Make a point to maybe write it down on the paper in front of you or, or write it down on your arm if you want to. Either one's fine. But definitely connect with us by social media and keep informed as to what's happening. We've got things like this coming up frequently and often. All right, let's have a look at today's agenda. What do we have on our plate today? There's our agenda. Okay, so we got four things on our plate. Today's agenda might seem a little short. It's probably going to take us a good 25 or 30 minutes or so to go through. We're going to start off the discussion on asset mix and the rule of 100. We're then going to talk about risk versus return. We're then going to talk about a review of how to solve questions. Now, full disclosure, we did cover this one last week. So for those of you that watched last week's video, this little topic is probably going to be a bit of a refresher. But if you missed last week's video, then I strongly encourage you to stay and watch this. This is how our instructors are going to solve questions. Finally, we're going to take up some exam level questions along with our instructor's take on how to approach these different types of exam level questions. All right, so let's get started right now. And we're going to talk, talk about asset mix and the rule of 100. Okay, so it's often said that the single most important decision is the asset allocation or asset mix decision. Now the asset mix is simply the portion of cash, fixed income and equities that an investment portfolio consists of. But you know what? If you've never worked with a client before, and, and maybe you have no experience in the financial services industry, where do you start? I mean, I mean, how do you find a starting point? Where do you begin? Right? A lot of students don't know. Don't worry. A lot of students find themselves in the same position as well. And that's exactly what we're going to help you with today. So how do you determine an asset mix? Well, there's many ways of determining an asset mix for a client. 
There's the age approach, the life cycle approach, uh, a fancy one called the mean variance optimization, and, and many more. Now, you're not going to learn all of these different methods in this course today, but we are going to focus on one method in a minute. But let me be clear about one point first. Whatever asset mix is agreed upon, KYC, that is know your client, it requires that the asset mix be suitable for the client in terms of risk tolerance, investment objectives, time horizon, etc. So for example, it might be suitable for a working professional to have a, a 60 40 split of equities and fixed income with very little cash. Of course, it depends on the client's risk tolerance and other criteria and the advisor absolutely must use their own common sense and professional judgment for each client situation. However, for example, it likely would not be suitable to place an elderly client in 100% equities, except in perhaps very rare circumstances. Again, it depends. So what is the rule of 100? Well, this is simply known as the age approach or the age rule. And it's just one simple way of determining a starting asset mix. Again, I want to be clear, this is not really a rule, it's only a guideline that you might have to deviate from, but it helps you by suggesting a starting point of where to begin. Now, let me give you a quick caveat. The rule 100 is not the be all and end all, and it should not be completely relied upon in isolation. Any advisor, again, must determine whether the answer that the rule of 100 suggests make sense for the client and make any adjustments accordingly. Now the rule 100 simply works like this. It suggests that the client's age is the percentage of fixed income and cash in the client's portfolio. And as you can see on the screen, 100 minus age is the percentage of equities. So again, for the rule of 100, 100 minus age is the percentage of equities that'll make up a client's portfolio. And the remaining portion would consist of fixed income and cash. So how do you apply the rule of 100? Well, there's two examples on the screen for you right now. Example number one, we have an 80 year old client. Okay. So the rule of 100 suggests that 100 minus 80 is 20. So 20% should be in equities. And again, the remaining portion would be fixed income and cash. Example number two, we have a 20 year old client. So 20 year old client, the rule of 100 suggests 100 minus 20 is 80. So 80% 80 of the portfolio should be in equities and the remaining portion would be fixed income and cash. You know what? I'm going to give you guys a third example just to make sure it's completely clear for all of you. Let's say a client is 35 years old and saving for retirement. What's the rule of 100 suggest? 100 minus 35 is 65. So the rule of 100 suggests a client might be 65% in equities and the remaining portion, which is I think 35% would be fixed income and cash. Remember, we call it the rule of 100 because the total of equities and fixed income will be 100%. So 65% equities plus 35% fixed income added together will be 100%. So again, I want to stress the advisor absolutely must use their own common sense, professional judgment for each client situation as the rule of 100 may not be suitable for all clients. In fact, you might find that some people simply cannot handle any risk at all. These people likely should never be in equities and quite probably may need a large percentage of their portfolio dedicated towards really safe investments like like cash or GICs or, or money market funds, but, but maybe nothing riskier than that. Again, it depends. All right, let's have a look now at risk versus return. So it's very important to note that mutual funds have been historically very popular because they can be bought or sold in small amounts. And it's this feature that's allowed many investors to get started saving towards their goals such as retirement. Also, they come in all sorts of varying degrees of risk too, so it's pretty easy to find something that's suitable for almost any kind of investor. However, as you can see on the chart, 
risk and return are interrelated. They go hand in hand. So to earn higher returns, investors must usually choose investments with higher degrees of risk. So let's talk about some of these funds. Down here in the bottom left, we got the money market fund. What are these? Well, this is mostly very short-term investments, which are what we call cash and cash equivalents. There's not going to be any equities in a money market fund at all. In fact, I believe that the, the term to maturity of the investments inside of money market funds is nine months or less. Next, we have mortgage funds and then bond funds. What are bond funds? Well, bond funds, this could be domestic bonds, it could be foreign bonds, all depending on what type of bond fund it is. But again, no equities. Now we've got a balance fund. Balance funds are what? They're combinations of bonds and equities. Maybe it's 50% bonds, 50% equities. You know what? I've seen things that are 60% equities, 40% bonds. I've seen 70% equities, 30% bonds. In fact, I've even seen 70% bonds, 30% equities, and still called a balance fund. So again, very important to look at how this balance fund is actually composed, what that asset mix is between equities and fixed income and cash. Dividend fund, equity fund. What's an equity fund? Equity fund is probably what it sounds like. It's mostly equities, maybe 80% maybe equities, maybe more, okay? But it could be domestic equities, it could be foreign equities, uh, US equities, international equities. It could be large cap equities, mid cap equities, small cap equities. It could be growth equities, value equities, all sorts of different types, all right? And then we've got a real estate fund and a specialty fund. And I want you to note the specialty funds at the very highest end of the risk return relationship here. You're taking a large amount of risk to get this fund. So what is a specialty fund? Well, maybe it's got 100% equities, but perhaps it's something other than equities. Maybe it's things like commodities or, or precious metals or, or derivatives, things like that. In fact, this could be, you know, funds devoted towards oil or gas or, or precious metals like gold or silver or platinum, things like that, okay? Now, given the level of risk behind each of these type, different types of funds, it's very important to know your client and to really understand a client's risk tolerance, their investment objectives, their time horizon, their personal financial circumstances, etc. All things being equal, it's always better to err on the side of caution. Now, you'll probably notice this at the very top, we actually have a memory aid right up here, okay? And we've got a great memory aid. It can help you remember what goes where. The way it works is this. The first letter of each of the words of the memory aid is a reminder of the first letter of each of the funds in the risk versus return chart. So my mortgage broker brought down every rate substantially. And this works like this. Money market fund, mortgage fund, bond fund, balance fund, dividend fund, equity fund, real estate fund, specialty fund. So again, my mortgage broker brought down every rate substantially. You know what? I would make a point of learning this memory aid, realizing it goes in order from lowest risk to highest risk. And if you can get this memory aid nailed down, it could very well help you to get some exam marks when you're trying to figure out what fund to choose based on what kind of risk a client wants to take. Now, one final point I want to make before I leave this screen. This risk line right here doesn't look all that steep, but I want to make this point here. The risk line is actually a lot steeper than this chart can show on the screen. I mean, a bond fund is not twice as much risk as a money market fund, it's more so. A dividend fund, an equity fund, is not just a little bit more risk than a bond fund, it's a lot more risk. Even a specialty fund, this is significantly more risk than an equity fund or a balance fund or anything else. So just recognize that the actual steepness might be more like this, right? Maybe more, okay? But we just can't reflect that on the screen in front of you. So again, keep in mind, there's a re relationship 
between risk return. If you want higher returns, you generally got to take more risk, but nothing is guaranteed. Nothing is guaranteed. All right, let's move on. Review, solving questions. Okay, so we've got three points here I want to make. First one is number one, read the question first, RTQF. Now, where this really comes valuable is in longer questions or longer scenarios. And what you generally want to do is you want to look for the question mark. You want to try to identify what the actual question is. But either way, whether you're working with a long question or a short one, what you want to do is this. You want to highlight, underline, or circle key words in the question such that you truly understand exactly what you're reading, what the question's asking you. And if you need to, and it's a longer question, then definitely go back and read that whole scenario, but focus on what is relevant to what you're trying to figure out, to what you're trying to solve, okay? Step number two is to then to read all four answer choices carefully, and then ask yourself, okay, what can I eliminate? If I've got four random answer choices and I'm just making a guess, I've already got a one in four chance of getting things right. What is that? 25%, right? If I can narrow one down to maybe three answer choices, that's going to improve my odds of getting the right answer. If I can narrow it down to maybe two answer choices, that's definitely going to improve my odds of getting the right answer. Okay, I got a 50-50 chance. You know what? You know what? I've actually done this before. If I can eliminate three answer choices, and I've got no idea what the right answer is, but I've eliminated three answer choices, then whatever that, that answer has left over is, that's the one I'm gonna choose, right? I, I'm probably gonna get the right answer at that point. So, you know what, as I'm going through that, maybe you wanna make, make X's or, you know, if you think an answer's wrong, maybe give it a small check mark if you think it's right, or, or maybe even draw a line across an answer. Right? If you think it's wrong, to, to really try to eliminate it in your head. But whatever you're doing, make sure to you know, use this process elimination, narrow down your answer choices, and then simply choose your best remaining answer. Right? Choose your best remaining answer from those remaining answer choices. Now, if I can offer all of you one good piece of advice, it's this. Once you've chosen an answer, don't change your answer unless you are absolutely 100% certain that you've made a mistake. And I, and I mean the kind of mistake where, where, for example, the question was, what is 2 plus 2? And we all know the answer is 4. But if you got that question, what is 2 plus 2, and you wrote down something different, I don't know, 6, 11, 54, who knows, right? But that's such an obvious, clear mistake, that's the kind of answer you might change. But other than that, don't change your answer. Whether you know it or not, the answer that you finally decided on, that's probably your best bet. So stick to it. All right. Are you guys ready for some questions now? Let's put our thinking hats on and let's get to work. Question number one. Here we go. Question number one. An investor is seeking a fund that provides the following cash flow, a possibility of capital gains, and a reasonable safety of principle. What fund do you recommend? What fund do you recommend? Okay. So what do we have? We've got A specialty fund, B equity fund, C bond fund, and D money market fund. You know what I noticed right away? I notice we've got a bunch of criteria that we've got to meet, and so they're asking for a recommendation. But you know what the other thing I notice is? I notice that of these four answer choices, they're in order of risk, starting from the lowest one here. Money market fund is actually the least risky fund. I know a specialty fund is the most risky fund. I know a bond fund's got more risk than a money market fund. I know that an equity fund falls somewhere in between a specialty and a bond fund. And again, if you're not sure how I did that, remember that memory aid. My mortgage broker brought down each rate substantially. Okay, and that's a good memory aid to keep in mind. It's going to help you to remember how these funds are ranked in terms of risk. All right. So if I look at this, 
knowing that risk and return, that memory aid can really come in handy. Now, let's start with the bottom here. A money market fund, does it have a reasonable safety of principle? Yes. Does it have a possibility of capital gains? No. Does it have cash flow? Yeah, but it's really, really minor. It's small, right? So I'm, I'm probably going to eliminate a money market fund. It doesn't have a potential for capital gains. It doesn't meet all three criteria. It doesn't make sense. So let's eliminate D. Money market fund is gone. What about a bond fund? Well, a bond fund can earn interest income and the potential for capital gains, right? A bond fund is reasonably safe compared to an equity fund or a specialty fund. This could be a good answer. I'm going to keep it. But you know what? For, for some of you who just wondered what I said about capital gains, let me make this point. If you buy a bond at a discount and it matures at par value, that difference is a capital gain. Right? If you buy a bond at a discount and you sell it for more than what it's worth, either before or at maturity, again, that's a capital gain. Okay? So you got to recognize what it is. That being said, if you buy a bond at a premium and it matures for less, that's a capital loss too. Right? So bonds can earn capital gains. They do have you know, cash flow. Reasonable safety of principle, I'm going to say yes, you know, they're reasonably safe. They're not, you're not going to get really wild fluctuations unless something happens to the underlying issuer. So I'm going to keep C because it does make a lot of sense to me, right? Let's have a look at B, the equity fund. Now, an equity fund might provide the possibility of capital gains. It may or may not have cash flow. I mean, it all depends whether or not it's paying dividends. But does an equity really have a reasonable safety of principle? No, I'm going to say no. So I'm going to eliminate, I'm going to eliminate B. And what about a specialty fund? Well, this, this could be an equity fund with a lot of equities. More often, though, it's some kind of a you know, special commodity fund or a precious metals fund. Maybe focus on oil or commodities like, like soya beans or pork or, or you know, coffee beans or whatever. Doesn't make sense. It does not have a reasonable safety principle. It may not even have a cash flow. Pretty much the only thing a specialty fund is good for might be the possibility of capital gains. So I'm going to eliminate A as well. So let me be clear. D is gone. B is gone. A is gone. We probably put X's beside you know, these three here. Maybe we cross them out. We probably have a small check mark to try C. It's our only remaining answer choice. Let's find out if C makes the most sense. I think it does. Yes, it does. C is the right answer. So what do we keep? We kept C because bonds earn interest income. They do have the potential for capital gains. And a bond fund has got, you know, it's reasonably safe, especially compared to an equity fund or a specialty fund. This is your best answer for this question. And great, I mean, you know what? If any of you struggle with this question, this is kind of an exam level question. This is something that, you know, I, I would definitely want to know before walking to the exam. It's something, you know, that, um, it really touches on, you know, your, you know, knowing your funds well and knowing the risk return, you know, relationship between all those different types of funds. So definitely understand how, you know, how we arrived at this answer. All right, let's move on to question number two. Question number two. Okay. So Josh is 35 years old. He earns a good income. He's knowledgeable about investments. He's saving to buy a house in the next two years. Josh has a stable job as a project manager, has a high risk tolerance. What asset mix of equities would you recommend? A, 65%, B, 50%, C, 35%, D, 0%. Zero, okay. All right. So, you know what? This is a fantastic exam level question. It really tests your knowledge of risk versus return. But I think this question actually does more than that. Yeah, I think it does more than that. You know what? This question. I think it tests our knowledge of KYC, know our client, and our ability to apply professional judgment to a situation. All right. So what do we what do we know here? Well, we know that Josh is knowledgeable about investment. You know about investments. So he's got a good investment in, uh, good investment knowledge. Okay. This implies he's familiar with fixed income and equities, and it implies that a higher portion of equities could very well be suitable for him. Right. He's also got a good income. 
Okay, we're told he's got a good income, he's got a stable job, and he's got a high risk tolerance. Again, these are all things that kind of imply a higher portion of equities could well be suitable for him, right? So let me ask all of you guys, what does the rule of 100 suggest? What do you guys think? What does the rule of 100 suggest? Okay, well, he's 35 years of age, so the rule of 100 suggests 100 minus 35 is 65, so a 65% allocation towards equities, and the remaining portion be fixed income and in cash, right? 65% portion towards equities, and our question was, what asset mix of equities would you recommend? A seems to make a lot of sense. You know, I, I could make an argument for B, 50% as well, right? But this equities portion kind of makes me lean towards either A or B. And of these two choices, I'd probably lean more towards answer A since he's got a high risk tolerance and good investment knowledge. And it seems to align well with what the rule of 100 suggests. What do you guys think? Is there anything we're missing? Well, you know, hold on, hold on. Let me see here. Are there any limitations or personal circumstances that we need to take in consideration in Josh's situation? Well, what's his investment objective? What's his time horizon? Well, I, he's, he's saving to buy a house in the next two years. Oh, interesting. Okay, okay. Josh is saving to buy a house in the next two years. So this implies his investment objective is to buy a house and he's got a short time horizon, only two years. And I think this is key to solving this question. Now, when a client has a short time horizon, then most often the only suitable investments are ones that provide a reasonable safety of principle because a client might not be able to make up for any loss of capital in such a short time period. Equities, to be clear, do not provide any safety of principle, although they might all provide some potential for capital gains and, and some of them maybe some investment income as well. Okay, But this short time horizon, I think, eliminates A, it eliminates B, and I think it eliminates C as well. In fact, this answer, this last one, D, the only remaining answer seems to make the most sense. It's got a 0% allocation toward equities. So, you know, the key point here is that although the rule of 100 suggested perhaps a 65% allocation toward equities, we've got to apply our professional judgment to arrive at what we think could be the right answer. Let's find out if it's the right answer. Ah, yes it is. Yes it is. It's a curveball. They threw us a curveball in this question. All right, so on a side note, can anybody tell me what kind of a mutual fund might have a 0% weighting toward equities? Well, yeah, yes, perhaps a bond fund, but keep in mind, bond fund you know, uh, valuations will fluctuate with changes in market interest rates, but bonds can also have capital gains and capital losses like I discussed previously. So more likely, this is a money market fund, right? More likely, this is a money market fund and given you know that Josh wants to make a down payment for a house in the next two years, he probably can't handle any loss of his money. That makes the most sense. Okay, great question. This this is a good exam level question. One that I would definitely you know study and and make a point of knowing, and certainly make a point of knowing how the rule of one hundred works, how that risk versus return relationship chart works, and definitely learn that memory age, what well, memory aid. Uh, what is it again? My mortgage broker brought down every rate substantially. Okay. All right. What do we have next? Okay. So we're in the very last screen now. Two key points here. Number one, it says, make sure to keep track of your progress using the CY Learning study schedule for your course. So if you've got your study, get study schedule downloaded and printed, I hope all of you do then make a point of ticking off each of the activities as you do them. Put a check mark beside, you know, when you've done your reading, put a check mark beside when you've done your flashcards, put a check mark beside when you've, you know, done your chapter quiz questions. If you've got the videos for the course, put a check mark beside the videos as you complete them as well. Make sure to track your progress, 
stay on track with your studies, and it's gonna be a really good motivational thing for you, you know, as you see yourself progressing towards the end. Secondly, if you're a CY Learning student with an active subscription, make a point to book a complimentary one-on-one -on -one session using this link below. Again, I do wanna point out space is limited. It is on a first come first serve basis. You know, I had some great conversations last week and a few weeks before as well. So did, uh, so did Andre, so did Corey, so did some of our other trainers like Josh. But you know, make a point to book that session and, and come prepared, ask us questions. Maybe you got questions about fixed income, maybe you got questions about equities, maybe you got questions about you know, risk and return and mutual funds. Heck, maybe you even got questions about derivatives, right? I know we had a challenging question a few weeks ago about derivatives and some of you are still you know, scratching your heads about that one. So definitely come to this session prepared, ask us questions and we're gonna give you some clear answers. All right, that's all I have for all of you today. Thank you so much for joining us on this webinar. Please enjoy the rest of today, and I definitely look forward to seeing all of you again here next week. Thank you, and take care.